Welcome to Just Asia, AHLC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. Five Sri Lankan police arrested over custodial death of suspect. Kangaroo Court sentences Cambodian activist to two and a half years imprisonment. Campus protests in Delhi met with violence. Police forcibly cancel private seminar on border security force killings. BBC journalists charged with criminal defamation over Phuket property story. NGO calls for UN peacekeeping mission to Rakhine, Burma. Urgent appeals from Nepal and Pakistan. Welcome to AHLC TV's Just Asia. I'm April Wong. This week's episode of Just Asia begins with Sri Lanka, where five police officers, including a sub-inspector, have been arrested in connection with the death of a suspect in custody at the Peliagoda police station. Resident of Biagama, 42-year-old Chadik Shaman Wikramachi, was arrested on February 25th, following information provided by another suspect. The next morning, when Chadik's family were about to visit the police station, they were told that he had been taken to the Colombo National Hospital. Eventually, Chadik's body was recovered at the police mortuary in Colombo. His shirtless body, covered in sand, was handed over to the family on a tray. According to DIG Piyatha Jayakodi, Chadik fell ill while in police custody and was taken to the hospital, where he passed away. Following a post-mortem examination on February 26, the judicial medical officer announced that Chadik's death was due to either dehydration or internal bleeding. The arrested police officers are due to be produced before the Colombo Magistrates Court. In Cambodia, land rights activist Tan Vani was sentenced to two and a half years imprisonment on February 23rd as well as a fine and a compensation payment. Vani was found guilty of inciting violence and assaulting security guards as a protest in 2013. None of the guards whom she allegedly assaulted testified during the trial, however, and in fact, according to Vani's lawyer, the woman the guards accused of violence was not Vani, but a 50-year-old woman not present in court. Furthermore, eyewitness testimony confirming that Vani and other protesters did not use violence noted that the guards were armed with batons and shields, while the protesters only had lotus flowers and loudspeakers. The judge really presided over a kangaroo court that showed no real evidence to require for a conviction, said Phil Robertson, the Asia Deputy Director for Human Rights Watch. According to Vani, the courts do not use their consents. They just wait for orders from powerful men. They are using my case to intimidate other people and scare others to not protest. Cambodia has a long history of land conflicts and communities who fight for their rights are increasingly harassed. The lack of publicly available land registered detailing state land boundaries means authorities can confiscate any land claiming that affected families are living on state property. Any protests against the loss of land lead to intimidation, violence and judicial prosecution. Van is the most prominent activist from Phnom Penh Boyongkak area, which was once a large scenic lake but now has been filled into make way for construction. Moving to Bangladesh, Police forced participants to cancel a private seminar on extrajudicial killings in the capital city of Dhaka. On February 25, civil society group People's Movement for Democracy organized a seminar, Murders Across the Borders, the Responsibilities of the State at Spectra Convection Center, Gushan Diplomatic Enclave. Just as the seminar was about to begin, police appeared. Sub-Inspector Mr. Subrata approached the stage saying no prior permission had been taken from the police and asking the organizers to stop the seminar. When the organizers and panelists asked which legal profession prevented people from hosting meetings in private places, Mr. Suprata could not answer. Instead, the police officer said that hosting meetings in a diplomatic enclave without prior police permission is prohibited. The sub-inspector further said, 
I will not let the meeting happen. The organizers were finally compelled to cancel the seminar. Freedom of speech, expression, and opinion is consistently curtailed by Bangladesh authoritarian government. The seminar was attended by the families of those extrajudicially killed by the border security force along the Indian-Bangladesh border areas. Over a thousand Bangladeshi citizens have been killed in the last ten years by the BSF. Their family members meet to share their plight and voice their concerns. Next, India is seeing large student protests against violence and threats to freedom of expression, beginning with Ramjas College of Delhi University. The Akhil Bhatia Vidyarthi Parshad unleashed violence against students and teachers there. The ABVP, student wing of the ruling Bhatia Janta Party, was incensed and an invitation extended to Umar Khalid, a student whom it calls anti-national for his dissenting views. Despite being present in large numbers, the Delhi police did nothing to stop the violence by the ABVP members. Rather, many police were rather caught on camera assaulting peaceful students and even indecently groping women students. To further state complicity in the ABVP violence, Union Minister for Home Affairs Kiran Rijiju made obnoxious attacks on student Kumachar Kau, daughter of a Mathurat Indian Army officer. Ms. Kau had opposed the violence with a social media, posting a certa that she is not afraid and was immediately threatened with murder and rape. Instead of taking action against those threatening her, Minister Rijiju questioned her motives. They emboldened the right wingers and brought more threats to her, forcing her to get security cover and flee Delhi. This open attempt of threatening and chasing away dissenters get generate a massive resistance, including a peaceful march joined by thousands in Delhi University. The government was forced to take symbolic action. As of now, two ABVP members have been arrested for violence, and the police commissioner has promised investigation and action. The present violence is in fact a continuation of state-led crackdowns on freedom of speech and assembly in campuses across India. The crackdown began in February 2016 at the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University, based on bogus sedition charges, for which the authorities have failed to file charges even a year later. Just Asia speaks to Samal Pandey for details. See, the problem is not anti-nationalism. Anti-nationalism is just a bogey. The current regime and its supporters are invoking on peaceful protests, democratic voices of dissent everywhere. What happened in Ramjas College in DU had happened in JNU. What happened in JNU had happened in uh, Hyderabad University. Who are these people who are being dubbed anti-national? Why was Rohit Bimla killed? Rohit Bimla was dubbed anti-national by a union minister for seeking Dalit rights, which are enshrined in the constitution of India. What happened in JNU? In JNU, people were peacefully protesting uh, for the Kashmir people's right to citizenship and all that, which are being denied. They were called anti-national. What happened in Ramjas? In Ramjas, Umar Khalid and Shahila uh, Rashid uh, were, were invited, two JNU leaders were invited in a seminar to speak academically on Bastar. Now, the seminar was cleared by the, the university body, the, the college body. It was a legal event. It, the event had sanction of the college authorities and yet the ABVP people, the Akhirbarti, Vidyarthi Parishad people came and cracked down. What happened afterwards? Gurmeher Kaur, a student, incidentally a daughter of a martyred soldier of India, said that I am not afraid of uh, ABVP violence. I will assert my right to dissent. I will assert my right to speak. Now this is what? This is a right, fundamental right guaranteed by the constitution of India. So anti-nationalism is not the issue. The real problem is the violence being committed in the name of nationalism. The violence which is not accepted, not supported by either law or the constitution or the state bodies. What is happening is worrisome. Supreme Court of India has said time and again that even like holding anti-India views is not anti-national unless you call for violence. And now we have a union minister who trolls a 24-year-old girl who says that someone is polluting her mind for speaking of her mind, for expressing her opinions. This is the real problem. The real problem is that the current regime cannot 
uh, is not allowing other ideologies or any voices of dissent to critic, to rage voice, to say that something is being wrong, to say that we need Dalit rights, you are anti-national. You want tribal rights, you are anti-national. You want students' rights, you are anti-national. This really is the problem. The problem is law enforcement agencies siding with these marauding mobs. Delhi police is standing by and not stopping the ABUP guys who were committing violence. The minister of the Home Minister of India not uh, stopping the goons who were giving rape threats to the girl, but stopping but uh, calling her anti-national state. That is the problem. Next, in Thailand, BBC journalist Jonathan Hatt appeared in Phuket court on February 23rd after a lawyer brought a criminal defamation case against him over an investigation into fraud on the popular tourist island. The prosecution was sparked by a September 2015 report by Hatt, the BBC Southeast Asia correspondent, looking at how two foreign retirees were scammed out of their properties in Phuket. The report featured local lawyer Pratan Tunarak, who apparently notarized one of the foreigners' signature without him being present. Mr. Pratan has now filed a defamation case, saying the reports caused him to be defamed, insulted or hated, had faces an additional charge under the Computer Crimes Act, which has a five-year maximum jail penalty. Had has had to surrender his passport to the court, leaving him unable to work across Asia as he fights what is likely to be a two-year court battle. The BBC said it stands by its journalism and intends to clear Hat's name. Rights groups say the case exposes how Thailand's defamation and computer crime laws scoop play investigative journalism and make it difficult to expose wrongdoing in an endemically corrupt country. Many activists and journalists are harassed through criminal defamation lawsuits in Thailand. Moving to Burma's Rohingya minority, Otika, a Bangladesh NGO has made a report to the UN Human Rights Council after interviewing some hundred Rohingya refugees who fled neighboring Bangladesh. The report includes the testimony of several refugees from January 2017 all of which detail rape, assault and violence. The Burmese military indiscriminately raped women and girls, in many instances in front of their families, while others were held as sex slaves in their camps. Thousands of Rohingya men were taken away by soldiers, never to be seen again. Otika is calling on the UN to send a peacekeeping mission to Rakhine State, as well as initiate independent prop commissions to investigate the military abuses there. Finally, the Urgence Appeals Weekly features two cases from Nepal and Pakistan. In Nepal, police have used excessive force against secondary school students protesting the arrest of a fellow student in the Machawa area of Rupandahi district, Nepal. The police beat the students as well as used gas canisters against them. The police also arrested many students. In Pakistan, the rangers and police have conducted joint operations against Sindhi political activists after the suicide bomb blast at the shrine of Shabazz Kalenda Sawan. Although ISIS was responsible for the blast, law enforcement agencies unleashed violence against secular elements of Sindh province. More than 100 activists were arrested in two days, and their whereabouts are unknown. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on this and other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia/justasia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.